All right, this section, it's going to be a lot better than the previous couple sections. So if you're kind of worried about that, don't worry, it's getting better. Um, in the previous couple sections, we saw how to multiply, divide, you know, rational expressions. This section, it doesn't say it in the title, but basically we're going to be learning how to add and subtract them. So even though it's called expressions containing several radical terms, I guess it's like if you have several radical terms adding or subtracting, you might want to add them or subtract them. So okay, what does it say here? When two radical expressions have the same indices, you know, or index, and radicands, they are said to be like radicals. So in order to add or subtract them, you add or subtract their coefficients. So whatever number's in front of the root, you add or subtract those guys. But you do not change the radical or the index. So it's kind of weird. And the kind of behind the scenes, that notice that they're saying they have to have the same index, so the same type of index, and the same radicand. So not only do they have to have the same index in order to add and subtract, they have to have the exact same thing inside their roots. If one of those things is off, you can't add or subtract them. It has to be both of those things happening or else you can't. So for example, in example 1 part A, you see that it's the square root of 3 plus the fourth root of 3. You can't add those because they have different indices or indexes, whatever. Because one's, you know, this is a index 2, that's an index 3. And then kind of similarly in part B, we want to subtract the square root of 7 minus the square root of 5. But we actually can't because they have different radicands. That's a 7 and a 5. If they were the exact same number, we could. Isn't that crazy? So not only the indices have to be the same. Like here in part B, the indices are the same. But they have to have the same radicand as well. And here they're different. Crazy. All right. But like in part C, notice that it's the exact same index, it's a square root, it's a square root. But then, and then also radicand, it's a 3 and it's a 3. So this one we're able to check. But like it says, all you do is you combine their coefficients. So the way I like to think of it, it's kind of like, what if you had an x plus an x? How do you add those guys together? Is that an x squared? No. You think of their coefficients, right? It's like a 1x and a 1x makes a 2x. So it's going to be kind of similar to that. It's going to be, like this is my brainstorm. I'm just going to add the coefficients. There's a 1 in the front, a 1 in the front, that's 2. But the square root of 3 is not going to change. It's the exact same. So it's weird. I kind of want to go 3 plus 3 is 6, you know, but that's only when you multiply or divide radicals, the, um, the radicand changes. But when you add or subtract them, the, ra the in ah, radicand and index don't change. Only the number in the front, the coefficient changes. So it's kind of hard to remember that, but it's good. it's a good and very important so let's try part part B. It should be part D. What the heck? Hello. So part D, um, you got 8 fifth root of 9 minus 3 fifth root of 9. So I have to make sure they have the same index. Yes, they're both fifth roots. Check, check. You don't have to write that, but that's kind of in your head. They have the same radicand. They do. The same thing inside the root. Yeah, they're both 9s. Perfect. All I have to do is subtract their, their uh, coefficients. 8 minus 3 is a 5. Then I don't change the index, still a 5, and I don't change the radicands, it's still a 9. All you do is subtract their coefficients, that's it. Nothing else changes. Yeah, so it'll be like 8 minus 3, 5. And then you just kind of copy the exact same radicand, the exact same index. And that's it. It's, I mean, it's not really difficult, it's more, the difficult thing is trying to keep myself from that going. 9 minus 9 is 0 or something, or 3 plus 3 is 6. I want to add the radicands or subtract the radicands, but I'm not supposed to. That's the hard part, is trying to hold myself back from that. Alright, how about in part E? Are we able to subtract these guys? No, because the radicands are different. The, radica the radicand of the first, the left one is 8, and the radicand of the right one is 2. So I'm not able to subtract. However, I think I can simplify one of them then add, right? Or then subtract. Okay, so that's true. I think I'm able to do that. We have 3 square root of 8. Okay, if I think about square root of 8, what can he be? Well, you can um, factor 8 into primes. 8 is 2 times 4. 4 is 2 times 2. Since the index is a 2, I need a group of 2. I'm going to write this as 2 squared times that extra 2 that didn't get used. 
that'll be a square root of 2 squared times a square root of 2. This 2 gets to escape, but this one doesn't. Alright, there it is. Let me rewrite this guy. It's, there's a 3 in the front, but now I've simplified the square root of 8 into 2 square root of 2. I'm going to replace that guy. 2 square root of 2. And I kind of don't want it to look like 32, because it's supposed to be a 3 times this thing. I'm going to write 3 times 2 square root of 2. And I would try to attempt to do the same thing to the second radican, but it's a 2. You can't really break 2 down. There is no square root of 2. So he'll just have to stay and hope he can combine with the other one when it's simplified. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, now I'm going to multiply these two guys in the front. 3 times 2, since they're both outside the root, they can multiply. That's 6 square root of 2 minus... Alright, now you have 2 square root of 2. So let's see, 6 minus 2, that's 4 square root of 2. And again, try not to go 2 minus 2 is 0. You just subtract the coefficients. 6 minus 2. There we go. Alright, so that's that's a good thing to keep in mind that just in, just because they have different radicands, that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing you can do. You might be able to simplify one or both of them until you are actually able to subtract or add or whatever the case may be. How about part F? Let's see, what do we have there? Part F, we have a fifth root of, or sorry, fourth root of 5 another fourth root of 5, and another fourth root of 5. So actually they're all like terms. And if you want, if you want to kind of compare this, this is like having x minus 3x plus 7x. and Because the coefficients are 1, negative 3, and 7. So you're really just combining the coefficients, right? 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 7 is 5, so it's like 5x. That's kind of how I compare these guys. That's how they behave. When I combine all these guys, my coefficient will be a 5, because all the coefficients combined, 1 minus 3 plus 7 is 5. But then the radic radicand and the index are staying the same. Don't change those guys. There we go. Alright, not bad. How about part G? This is one where I say, oh my gosh, those radicands are so different. There's no way I can subtract these guys. Unfortunately, since we know how to simplify radicals, we're probably, probably going to simplify one or both of these until they can actually be combined. This is where we know too much, and I wish we didn't know as much as we know, you guys. Sad but true. So I don't know, it's up to you. You could focus on the left one or the right one first. I might, I guess because we read from left to right, I might focus on the left one. Kind of simplify him as much as possible. So let's see, it's a 2x, and then I have cube root of 24x to the fourth. I think maybe I'll give the 24 his own root and then the x to the fourth his own root. That might make it easier. Let's see, okay. 24 gets his own root, the x to the fourth gets his own root. There we go. And the 24, let me see, could I simplify that guy? Um, I might have to go off to the side and prime factor it, let me see. Uh, 24, he's up here, let's try. 24 is 2 times 12, okay. 12 is 2 times 6. 6 is 2 times 3. Alright, since it's a cube root, I need a group of 3 primes. Here we go. Here's a group of 3 twos. Alright, but the 3 is the odd man out. Alright, let me see. Let me simplify this guy. This is 2x. Alright, then cube root of... I have a group of 2 3... Or sorry, 3 twos. 2 to the 3rd, and then 1 extra 3 all by himself. Um, and then maybe I'll... I'm going to hold off on this. I'm going to think about that. But I'm just going to keep going down with this one. I got a cube root of, give the 2 to the 3rd his own cube root, and then the 3 his own cube root. That way at least the cube root and the cube can cancel for the 2. So I'm left with the 2x that was already out there, times this 2 that gets to escape, and then times this cube root of 3 that didn't get to escape. And I can multiply these guys together, that's 4x cube root of 3. Alright, now, now that I kind of have that down, I'm going to focus on the x to the fourth here that was also inside the root. That one, though, that's where you have to divide the index into the power, right? You can kind of do it in your head if you want. 3 can go into 4 once with 1 left over. Or you could write it off to the side. 3 goes into 4 once with 1 left over. Remember, the quotient is how many go outside, and the remainder is how many go inside. Alright, let me bring that guy down. He's, he's not going to change. That's as good as that one gets. Let's see, so these, all these things are multiplied together, so if there's anything that can kind of combine, I might as well do that. I think I'm going to bring this x and this x together. So it's 4, and then x times x would make x squared. 
And then since the three here and this X are kind of trapped inside the root, you might as well put them together so that they're, I don't know, at least in one root. Alright, so that simplified the left portion of this problem. Now let's we got the subtraction sign. Now let's focus on the right portion where it's cube root of 81 x to the 7th. Whew! So do something similar. I'm going to give 81 his own cube root and then the x to the 7th his own cube root. And see what, can, what I can do with either of those. Alright, so 81. I'm going to see if he can simplify, but I'll have to factor him into primes off to the side. 81 is 3 times 27. 27 is 3 times 9, and 9 is 3 times 3. Since the index here is a 3, I want a group of 3 of the same prime. So I have one group of 3, and then one extra 3 that's kind of off. He's got his own thing going on. So I have 3 3's, and then one extra 3 that's kind of the odd man out. And I might keep going with this guy, and then focus on this x later. So that's a cube, and they split it up into two roots. Cube root of x, 3 to the third times the cube root of 3. Alright, the cube root and the cube will cancel for this 3, but not for this other guy. He's going to have to stay inside the root. Poor little guy. Alright, now let's focus on this x to the 7th. I can do that dividing the index into the power thing to try to simplify him. His index is 3, his power is 7. 3 goes into 7 twice with 1 left over. That means one, or sorry, 2 x's get to escape because the quotient is how many go outside. The remainder is 1, that means 1 has to remain inside the root. Alright, so he'll, I'm going to bring him down. x squared, cube root of x. Alright, and then just to make this look pretty, this is kind of where this whole making it look pretty comes in handy for these types of problems. Because remember before we said anything that was outside the root you want to put to the left, so the 3x squared. And then anything that was stuck inside the root, like this 3 and this x, you want to put them together. Alright, that's a good idea, because now we can see that what's left over, these two big terms, they're like terms, because what's inside the radical is the same. 3x and 3x. The indices are the same. A cube and a cube. Alright, so all we have to do is subtract the um, coefficients. And then we'll be done. Coefficients. So we got a 4 and 4, let's say 4x squared minus 3x squared is like 1x squared, but you can just write x squared. Yeah, so if you're kind of taking this coefficient, 4x squared, subtracting this guy, and I got x squared. Everything else stays the same, though. The cube root and the 3x inside, they're exactly the same. No need to change those guys. Whew. All right. Those are tough. Okay. But I think still, it's, to me, it's a little better than the previous sections. The previous sections were pretty tough. Alright, there's not too much more left in this section. It's just a little bit, kind of more interesting stuff, trying, something different. But now we're going to look at multiplying, kind of like distributing, I guess. Because notice here in example 2, part A and part B, you kind of have two things inside the parentheses being or added or subtracted, and then something multiplying outside. So I haven't seen this before, but I think it's because, like, we didn't know if, whether we could subtract those, like, z and square root of 2, can we subtract those? Now we know we can't, but maybe we can distribute. So these kind of behave the way you would think they would. So if I distribute, I have a square root of 7 times z. Well, the square root of 7, 7's inside the square root, z is not. So I really can't do much. I can just write 7 in the square root times z. That's about it. However, the next one, the square root of 7 times the square root of 2, those are both inside the square root, so I can multiply them. 7 times 2 is 14. And a lot of times, you know what, you'll see, like in this first term, you notice the 7 is in the root, z is outside. Like we've seen before, usually the thing outside the root goes in the, on the left, and the thing inside goes on the right. You'll see them probably switch the two. You know why? You can kind of tell in this one, because like if you wrote that really quickly or something, and someone was trying to read your work, they'd say, hey, is that z inside the root or outside the root? You know, that's, that's, I think that's why they write the roots on the right side, because here, it's clear the z's outside, because he's in front, and then the 7's inside. I think that's kind of why they like to see roots on the right, because it won't be unclear what's inside and what's outside that way. All right, let's try something, something similar with part b here. We're going to distribute. So we've got a fourth root of y times a fourth root of y to the third, and then a fourth root of y times a fourth root of 3. Notice that everything's inside a fourth root, so I'm, I'm able to multiply everything together. First I have a fourth root of y times y to the third, I'll add their powers. 
y to the 1 times y to the 3rd, if I add them, I'll get y to the 4th, plus the 4th root of y times the 4th root of 3, I just do y times 3, or 3 times y, so 3y. And then from here, there's nothing I can do with the second term, but with the first term, you notice the index and the power are exactly the same, so they can cancel. But there's nothing really I, I can do with the second term. There's no fourth root of 3. It can't be simplified because it's too small a number. y inside a root, its power is 1, which is smaller than the index. So there's no really, you know, really no hope for him. That's as good as that one gets. All right. So far, so good, right? They're not too bad. I think this is just kind of getting us ready for the, what's going to, the last part of the section, what's coming on the next page. So it's just good practice. Let's try part C. But this is a good little review question. Um, I have 3 minus the square root of 5, two things subtracting inside parentheses with a power. Can I distribute the power? No. You can only distribute an exponent if the things inside are being multiplied or divided. If you're trying to add or subtract inside, you cannot distribute a power. So we've seen that before, but it's been so long it's worth probably remembering. But um, what are we going to do? Well, since it's, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to square something? Well, it means to multiply that thing by itself twice. So I'll just write this thing in parentheses twice, because that's really what it means to square something, right? And then, unfortunately, I'll have to foil it out, because it's two separate terms times two separate terms. All right. Let's see, I'll have first, outer, inner, last. All right. So my first times my first here is 3 times 3, that's 9. My outer is 3 times negative root 5. It's going to be negative because it's a positive times a negative. But notice the 3 is outside the root, the 5 is inside, so there's not really much you can do there. It's just 3 times root 5. And kind of similar for the inner one. Your inner term is a negative root 5 times a positive 3. That's going to be a negative. But one thing's outside the root, one thing's inside. There's not much you can do. Just write 3 times root 5. or You could write root 5 times 3, but you always want the root on the right side. And then the last times the last, it's a negative root 5 times a negative root 5. That's a positive. You could write root 5 times 5 is 25, or 5 times 5 is 5 squared. Either way you want to write it, it's going to end up with the same thing. So we have 9. And then notice these two guys are like terms. They both have the same index, so a square root. They have the same radicand, 5. So I can just subtract their um, coefficients. Negative 3 and negative 3 makes negative 6. And this last guy has a square root, which is 5. <coughs> Excuse me. So I thought I was done, but now I realize the first and the last term are now like terms. 9 and 5 make 14. And then I can write the minus 6 square root of 5. And for me, sometimes when I'm not paying attention, it's kind of tempting to subtract these, 4 minus 6. But they, remember, the 6 is attached to the root 5. So it's kind of like, what if you had 14 minus 6x? You couldn't go, oh, 14 minus 6 is whatever. Because a 6 is attached to something, and they're not, they're not like terms, so there's no way to subtract those guys. All right, I think if we try this last one, then we'll be pretty much ready for this last concept in this section. So it looks like a similar thing. you got two terms, root 11 plus 2, and then another two terms, root 11 minus 2. I think we're just going to have to foil it out. About the first times the first. You have root 11 times root 11. That's the square root of... 11 times 11 is 121. Or you could have root, written 11 squared. That's fine, too. The outer, you have root 11 times negative 2. That's a negative 2 square root of 11, because one's outside the root, one's inside. And then the inner, you have positive 2 times positive root 11. It's going to be positive 2 root 11, because they're both out, or one's inside, one's outside. The last time is the last, however. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. There we go. Now I want to look and see what happens. The first term, that has a square root, right? 121 square root is 11. Notice the outer and the inner cancel. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. And then I just have the last term, minus 4. So 11 minus 4 is 7, right? There we go. Interesting. So if you multiply, and you notice these kind of look like, um, what's it called? Like difference of squares, huh? Sort of. It's not a polynomial, but it kind of look like x plus y, x minus y, kind of. It's the same terms, you know, it has an 11 and an 11, a 2 and a 2, just different signs, a positive and a negative, or a negative and a positive. We kind of know that ends up being first squared minus last squared. 
But it's good to point out, or good to kind of keep in mind, because this will help. And the next thing we do that, we multiplied these guys together, the kind of difference of squares looking things, and we ended up with a root, you know, something that didn't have a root. It was just a whole number. So notice in the previous problem, or previous example, there was still a root in our answer. So that's not always the case when you kind of foil out root um, expressions. This one just happened to be that way because it was kind of this difference of squares type of problem. That'll always happen when you have the difference of squares type of thing. And that'll really help in this last part of this section. Okay. So unfortunately, you're probably not excited to see this guy. But rationalizing the denominator, if you remember that, that's where some mathematicians kind of came up with this idea of, well, if you have a, a root in your denominator, it's not simplified all the way, so you better do something about it. So we kind of saw what to do in previous sections, but this section we see what to do if there's more than one term in the denominator. Notice part A, it has 7 plus the square root of 3. Any problems we saw in that previous section, there was only one term in the denominator. I mean, it might have been 7 times square root of 3, but that's still technically only one term. I mean, there was never more than one term, you know, with a plus or a minus in between. So these guys get more complicated, but once we kind of see what the trick is, it'll be pretty easy. The hard part's just trying to remember what that trick is. If you, you know, it's been a while since you saw it. Okay. So let's see, just to show you kind of why we need a new trick. You don't have to write this down, but this is just kind of, in case you're curious, why can't we just use the same thing we did before? You know, like before, remember we said, so for example, in part A, I have a square root of 3 to a 1 power, but I want to see the power and the um, index match, right? So maybe if I want to see um, the square root of 3 squared, you know? Because then the power and the index will cancel. Okay, well in the last section we said, well, what, what do I have to multiply by to get there? I need one more 3. Because then I'll have the 1 plus the 1 makes 2. But you know what, if I do that, the problem is, since there are two terms, I'm going to have to just distribute this guy onto both. And that denominator will become something I don't really want. It'll be the first term, 7, times the square root of 3. And then the square root of 3 times the square root of 3. That'd be like we wanted, the square root of 3 squared. So although this reduces, the square root of 3 squared is 3, your problem kind of disappeared from this term. Like, okay, yeah, there's no more root here, but now all of a sudden it popped up next to the 7. So you did get rid of the root where it was, but you put it somewhere else. And it's still a problem, because you don't want to see a root in the denominator. So that old trick won't work. We're going to have to come up with something else. And these directions here kind of tell us what to do. Um, we actually take advantage of what we saw in that previous example. Remember when we multiplied those kind of difference of squares type binomials together when it came to that? So, okay, what does it say? To rationalize the denominator of a rational expression containing two terms, like we have, you're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. I don't remember if we've talked about conjugate before, but just in case. Conjugates are basically, they have the same terms, like the ones in that part D of the last example, you know. Here we have, it was square root of 11 plus 2, square root of 11 minus 2. So the terms are the same, right? Square root of 11, square root of 11, 2, 2. Same terms, but opposite sign in between. So if you see a plus, you want to see a minus. If you see a minus, you want to see a plus. And that's pretty much the key. If you just do that, simplify, you're going to be good. So I just have to think about what's the conjugate of the denominator. Well, as it kind of describes, <coughs> excuse me, in part A, the conjugate of the denominator has the same term, so 7 and the square root of 3, but the sign in between is opposite. Since there's a plus there, I want a minus. There we go. Now we're talking. And of course, whatever you do to the bottom, you have to do to the top. And that's the key. Now it's just a matter of simplifying. And once we simplify, we're going to be home free. But you want to be really careful. Okay, what do we have? I have 4 on the top times 7 minus square root of 3. I'm going to think about that. On the bottom, I have 7 plus square root of 3, 7 minus square root of 3. And I just have to be really careful kind of multiplying everything out. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute this 4 into here. And then foil out the denominator since it's 2 terms times 2 terms. In the numerator, I have, what, 4 times 7 is 28. But then I have 4 times the square root of 3. 4 is outside, 3 is inside, so I'm going to have to just leave them separate. And then in the denominator, if I foil, first times first, that's 7 times 7, which is 49. Outer times outer, 7 times negative root 3. 
negative 7 root 3. Inner times inner, root 3 times 7, that's positive 7 root 3. Or you could write root 3 times 7, but remember you always want to write the root on the right side. The last times the last, that's a positive root 3 times a negative root 3. That's a negative root, you could write 9 or 3 squared, since it's 3 times 3. Alright, so looking at the numerator, there's not much I can do, because I have 28, and then 4 root 3. I mean, I would think, can I simplify 3 inside a root? No. And I can't combine those, they're not like terms, since the 4 is attached to a root. So that guy's not, not much is going to happen with that guy. The action's going to happen in, in the denominator. So in the denominator I have 49, but you notice just like in that part D of the previous example, the outer and the inner, negative 7 root 3, positive 7 root 3 cancel. So the outer and the inner cancel, what's left is the first, and then the last, the square root of 9 is 3. There we are. And then the last step would be simplify that, or you know, just subtract the denominator. So it's 49 minus 3, that's 46. There we go. So that answer looks totally different, and it kind of has bigger numbers, which makes me think it's not as simple as it started out, but there's no root in the denominator anymore, right? That's the thing. We kind of simplified it to where the root kind of popped up in the top instead of the bottom. But that's the key on these guys. If you see two separate terms in your, in your original problem like this guy, you notice there's a 7 plus root 3, or if it was two things subtracting, then you know you can't use the tricks from the previous section. You have to use this new conjugate idea. But it'll always work, that's kind of why I like it. I kind of actually like these better than the previous section, because the ones in the other section, you have to really think, like, okay, what do I have? What do I need? What do I have to multiply by? But now, I mean, it's pretty obvious it's just conjugate every time. As long as you recognize there are two separate terms, like here in part B. All right, yeah, just, it's really a matter of memorizing what to do. That's the hard part of these problems. And then, you know, being careful as you simplify and FOIL and all that. It's okay, part B. I have 4 plus the square root of 2, which is not the problem. Remember, the problem is having the roots on the bottom. So I want to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator, which means you have the same terms, like root 5, that's what I started with, root 2, that's what I started with. But there's a minus, so I want a plus. Because conjugate's the exact same thing, except changing the sign in the middle. And this one, I can tell, is already going to be trickier, because there's not just one term in the numerator, there's two terms. So I have to FOIL the numerator, this 4 plus square root of 2 times 5 plus square root of 2. I'll have to FOIL that out and the denominator. Root 5 minus square root of 2, root 5 plus square root of 2. Alright. As long as we're careful, I think we'll be okay. Well, on the numerator, I'll FOIL that guy out. First times first, 4 times 5 is 20. Outer times outer, 4 times the square root of 2 is just 4 square root of 2 since one's outside, one's inside. The inner times the inner, root 2 times 5, that's 5 root 2, kind of in a similar way. The last times the last, square root of 2 times square root of 2, you can write square root of 4 or square root of 2 squared. Alright. In the denominator, we're, I'm going to FOIL that out. First times first, square root of 5 times square root of 5 is square root of 25. Outer times outer, root 5 times root 2 is root 10. Inner times inner is a negative root 2 times a positive root 5. That's a negative root 10. The last times the last, a negative root 2 times a positive root 2 is negative root 4. Alright. I think it's looking good. Okay, well, I, I want to warn you right now. I don't know if you were thinking this, but you can cancel these root 4s. Remember when you have a fraction, you can only cancel like we saw in... Or like... Yeah, like we saw in a previous chapter. If you factor everything in the numerator so that it looks like a bunch of things multiplied together, and then you cancel one of those. But since everything's being added and, and subtracted here, you can't just cancel portions of it. So anyway, to try not to, do not try to reduce those guys. It's only if it was like, like if it was something times square root of 4 over something times square root of 4, then you can cancel them. But if that thing that you're trying to cancel is adding or subtracting, you cannot cancel it. We're just going to have to kind of whittle away at the top all by itself, not involving the bottom, and then whittle away at the bottom. So, okay, what do we have on the top there? 20? I'm not, I can't really do much with that. But the outer and the inner terms are like terms, since they have the same index and radicand. I'll add their coefficients. 4 and 5 makes 9. Don't change the index. The last term, the square root of 4, is just 2. So that looks, it looks pretty nice. In the denominator we have square root of 25, that's 5. The outer and the inner cancel, like we've noticed before. 
You know what I'm thinking right now is whenever you whenever you multiply conjugates, the outer and the inner are going to cancel. So you know what I might do from now on is don't even bother multiplying these out. When I'm multiplying the conjugates out, I might just do first times first, last times last, and don't even worry about the outer and the inner because they're going to cancel anyway, right? All right, so they cancel. Then the last term, square root of 4, is 2, and with the minus sign in front of it. So I think there's a little more we can do here. Let's simply the numerator has a 20 and a 2, they're like terms. I'm going to combine them, 22, plus the 9 root 2 that's not a like term, over 5 minus 2 is 3. There it is, beautiful. Oh yeah, and then right now, I might be tempted also to reduce this 3 and this 9. But you can't reduce them because there's a plus here. The only way you can reduce it is, let's say, if you try to factor a 3 out of the top. Like, and maybe if this wasn't a 20, it was a 21 or something. That's a 21, then you can factor a 3 out, and 7 plus 3 or 2 would be left, and then you can cancel them, something like that. But remember, you can't cancel unless the thing you're trying to cancel is being multiplied by everything, not adding or subtracting. So this one is really as good as it gets. Let's try part E. This one looks scary, but it's actually... Yeah, like, like I said, when they're all variables and no numbers, it's usually easier. Alright, well... Like we've done in the previous ones, I don't want to see any roots in the denom denominator, so I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator, which has the same terms but opposite sign. Since I see a plus, I want a minus. And of course, whatever you do to the bottom, you have to do to the top. Let's see how this goes. I'm going to be careful here. I've got a square root of z already there, times what I kind of added there, square root of x minus square root of z. I'll distribute that guy, see what happens. And on the bottom, I'm going to have to foil this out. Square root of x plus square root of z times square root of x minus square root of z. Alright, and the numerator I have, let's see. Square root of z times square root of x, that's square root of... You could write zx or xz. Usually you see them right in alphabetical order no matter what. So I'm going to write xz. And then minus square root of z times z would be z squared. Alright, and then in the denominator, if I foil that out, I've got first times first, that's the square root of x times square root of x, square root of x squared. And then you know what, remember we said the outer and the outer and the inner are going to cancel anyway. So if you want, you can do outer times outer, inner times inner, but I'm just going to skip it, because I know they cancel. I'll just do first and last. Last times last, square root of z times negative square root of z is negative square root of z squared. There we go, and this is another instance where it's maybe tempting to try to cancel those z's, but they can't cancel. Because they're adding and subtracting with other things. They're not multiplying with other things. What you can do, though, is each of these square roots and squares can cancel with each other since the index and the power match. So that's kind of nice. What will be left then? Um, the square root of x, z, you can't do much with that on the top. But the z got to escape the root for the second term, as did the x and the z in the denominator. So that's kind of nice. And that can't reduce again because the only way you could try to cancel those z's is if a z factored out of both. You know, if you tried to factor both and something factored out, that was a like factor. But you can't factor either numerator or denominator, so that's as good as that guy gets there. Alright, this one looks super complicated, but it's the same idea. It's just like, the execution is going to be more, you have to think about it really hard. So the denominator has two terms. It has... 2 square root of 3, that's one term. 5 square root of 2, that's another term. We'll have to multiply by its conjugate top and bottom. The conjugate has the same terms, 2 square root of 3, 5 square root of 2, just opposite signs. So since there was a plus, or sorry, a minus, I'll put a plus. Alright, now this one, the only thing you can do wrong is just not be careful, you know? I'm going to write this very carefully. But this was already the numerator. He's going to have to be foiled with what I'm multiplying by there conjugate of the denominator, and the same thing in the denominator. This tedious problem is kind of where, I'm kind of glad that I don't, I know that when you multiply conjugates, like the, in the denominator, that I don't have to multiply outer and inner because they're going to cancel anyways. That'll save me a little time at least. Alright, so on the numerator, I might write this out to be safe. I'm going to foil first outer, inner, last, that'll be the numerator. But for the denominator, I'm just going to do first and last. Like I said, because I know the outer and the inner are going to cancel anyway. That's how conjugates work. But be careful. For the first and the first, okay, we got 5 root 3 times 2 root 3. Okay, they're kind of, they both have a portion that's outside the root and a portion that's inside the root. 
you can multiply the outer parts and the inner parts. We have 5 times 2, that's 10. Inside the root is a 3 times a 3, which makes 9. Okay. And then for the outer term, what do we have? 5 root 3 times 5 root 2. I'll multiply those outer terms. 5 times 5 is 25. And in the inner terms, 3 times 2 makes 6. There we go. Alright. So far, so good. As long as you're careful, it should be good. And then the next, the inner, you have a negative root 11 times a positive 2 root 3. So it'll be a negative because it's a negative times a positive. The outer thing, there's, there's only one number that's outside the root, it's 2. So he has no one to multiply with, but the 11 times the 3, they're both inside. That'll make 33 inside the root. Alright, almost there. And then the last guy, the last times the last, you get negative root 11 times positive 5 root 2. That'll be a negative, since it's a negative times a positive. The number outside the root, the only one is 5. And the numbers inside the root, 11 times 2 will make 22. Alright, phew. And then in the denominator, what do we have? Um, remember, we're only going to do first times first and last times last. So I have first times first. That's 2 root 3 times 2 root 3. The outer numbers, 2 times 2 make 4. Root 3 times root 3 is root 9. And then, like we said, the outer and the inner are going to cancel, so don't even bother. But then the last times the last, what do we got there? That'll be 5 root 2 times 5 root 2. One of them negative, though. A negative times a positive will be a negative. And then 5 times 5, 25 outside. Inside, 2 times 2 is 4. There we go. Alright, I think we're doing great here. Alright. I'm going to look at the numerator. The first term, 10 root 9. Well, 9 has a square root, so he can escape the root. It'll be 10 times 3 then. Plus, let's see, 25. And then, there is no square root of 6, and he can't be simplified. Because even if you break 6 down, you know, 6 is 2 times 3. But I would need a pair of the same prime to escape the root. And there is no, you know, 6 times six is 2 times 3, and those don't have the same prime. So he can't really simplify. He's going to have to stay 25 square root of 6. And the same thing with the next guy. Square root of 33, I mean, 33 is um, 11 times 3. And those are both prime, but they can't escape the root because you would need two of the same prime to escape. And similarly with the last guy, 5 root 22. That's 2 times 11. But neither of those, yeah, you can't escape because you would need two of the same prime to escape. Alright. The denominator, we have 4 square root of 9, but 9 square root is 3. So I'm going to write that as 4 times 3 minus this other guy, 25 square root of 4, which is 2. We're almost there. I think there's not much we can do left except multiply the things that are next to each other, like here. 10 times 3 is 30, but the rest of the terms in the numerator, notice they're not like terms. Because if, if they have a radical, they have different radicands. Remember to add or subtract, they have to have the same radicand. So nothing in the numerator is a like term with each other, they have to stay separate. In the denominator we have 4 times 3, that's 12, minus 25 times 2, 50. Alright, I think once, once we maybe, um, what's it called? We subtract the denominators, then I think we'll be done. There's not much else we can do here. I'll leave the numerator as ugly as it is, because there's not much I can do. The denominator, though, 12 minus 50 is negative 38. There we go. That's a terrible answer, right? Terrible. Oh. And you might see them, a lot of times when you see a negative in the denominator, you'll see them throw it off to the side like this. Like the fraction bar and the negative on the side, and then a positive 38 on the bottom. It doesn't really matter, you know, they mean the same thing, but I just want you to know if you see this answer that I'm writing right now, and you say, wait, that's not what I got, you know, it really means the same thing, it's just, I think they think it looks a little prettier to not have a negative in the denominator, just throw it off to the side. Yeah, okay, that's probably um, better. This one's fine, you know, it's correct, this one's probably nice and prettier. Whew, alright, this section's pretty, pretty tough. I think it's getting a little better every time, you know, a little easier. Very complex though, you know, easy to make a silly mistake somewhere in there, so be careful. I think you're going to like the next section, it's it's pretty good. It's not the best in the world, but it's pretty good. No, the next section is my favorite actually, it's solving equations. Alright, well I'll see you there, it'll be fun. Hopefully you'll have fun too. 
and all right, I'll see you later.